Good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor and privilege for me to introduce our next guest speaker, Dr. Tanner Akjam. Historian Tanner Akjam is the inaugural director of the Armenian Genocide Research Program at Promise Institute, UCLA. Before coming to UCLA, Dr. Akjam held the Kalusian and Mugar and Endowed Chair of Armenian Genocide Studies at Clark University. Akjam is widely recognized as one of the first Turkish scholars to write extensively on the Arme Ottoman Turkish genocide of the Armenians in the early 20th century. He published extensively on Armenian genocide and Turkish national nationalism. His most known books are A Shameful Act, the Armenian Genocide, and The Question of Turkish Responsibility, and Young Turks, Crime Against Humanity, the Armenian Genocide and Ethnic Cleansing in the Ottoman Empire, both of which have received several awards. Akjan's latest book is Killing Orders, Talat Pasha's Telegrams and the Armenian Genocide. He is the founder of Krikon Bulgarian Online Archive. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Akja. Thank you so much. So, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here. I think 10 or 8 years ago I was here and just gave a talk. Uh, I'm a historian and typically the genocide scholar, we talk on historical events. And, uh, I was expected maybe to talk on Armenian genocide or certain historical part of it. And usually we produce new documents and or we just reinterpret the existing documentation and so on. But today I'm doing it, I'm going to do something totally different. I'm not going to present on Armenian genocide. Say, and I'm not also going to talk as a uh, historian. I look human rights activists. The genocide studies is always on the edge of academia and political activism. And uh, today I took my historian cap aside and we talk as a human rights activist because of the following reason President Biden acknowledged the genocide. And this was one of the major demand of Armenian diaspora and other human rights activists all over the world. Now this is a fact. Armenian genocide is acknowledged by the US, by the world powers. The big question is what's next? What should we do now? So I organized a conference on uh, March 25th. And I invited uh, Stuart Eisenstadt. How can I? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, I invited Stuart Eisenstadt. Uh, what I'm going to do today, I will show an interview. He was our keynote speaker. And uh, because of uh, some technical problems, we had an interview. And the interview is around 15 minutes, and I cut it down to 20 minutes. I thought I should show you this 20 minutes uh, interview and then frame it how we should understand this interview. Because of the post, you should maybe know about Stuart Eisenstadt, he's a, one of the top admins. So, officer in the United States. He was special advisor, he is today special advisor to the Secretary of State Blinken on Holocaust issues, and he is the president of Holocaust Museum in Washington. But his career started during Carter administration. He was one of the domestic chief advisor for the domestic political issues for Carter. Then he became one of the important diplomats in Carter administration related to Holocaust. And this role continued. You cannot believe even during Trump administration, he was the top advisor to President Holocaust related issues. During Carter administration, he had a special additional job he was the representative of the United States government, and you may all have heard about it. He was the main negotiator with Switzerland, Germany, 
France and Eastern European countries. And he finally was able to get billions of dollars from Switzerland, the gold case famous, and from Germany, the slave labor issues, you may have heard about it. So he is the top scholar or ambassador related to all house issues in the United States. And I invited him as the keynote speaker. And so the person is very important. It is the top administrator. One additional information, maybe to understand why I emphasize so much this context. For my conference, for my conference, I try to invite somebody from the state. Uh, to learn whether the State Department has any plans after the recognition of Armenian genocide related to Armenian genocide issues. They walled off. They didn't want to come. It was too early for them because there was no, there is no policy today, and so on. So he came and he spoke. Now we can listen to him. It's very important for me, for Armenian people, or generally, and we discuss so what and what can we do. So this is the interview, the 20 minutes, please. Michael Weitzler is the, uh, one of the important scholars. He was one of the leading legal advisors to the Holocaust restitution issues in the United States. So- Sorry, I'm having a sound issue. Um, we are very grateful that you are here. We are putting on the first conference on uh, restitution for Isaac and Armenian genocide at UCLA, and you are a keynote speaker uh, because of your extensive work for so many years that still continues today um, in the area of restitutions, Holocaust restitution, and other areas. And we are very grateful that you can inspire us. Uh, in order to go ahead and um, have a useful conference that we hope will begin something new. Well, it's my pleasure. This is a topic I've been very engaged in for decades. And I want to make clear at the outset that I'm speaking in personal capacity, not as a government employee and not as the head of the Fiscal Council of but purely in my personal capacity. Uh, I think that the UCLA uh, Promise Institute and the Yellow Law School Conference has the prospect of being the equivalent to the 1994 1995 Bard Graduate Conference that really elevated the issue of Nazi New York. Conference 1995, and uh, a number of scholars made presentations of their scholarly work on a topic that had been buried for over 40 years after World War II, namely the degree to which the Holocaust was not simply a mass genocide of six million Jews and millions of others, but it also was the greatest confiscation of property, cultural, private, global, uh, and illegal property in the history of the world. And that conference uh, really elevated the issue of how to do this I think that your conference really could be the equivalent for the Armenian genocide and for the Armenian confiscation. And to put it into context, I will. Uh, the Holocaust, the Shoah, uh, murdered roughly two thirds of the total number of Jews in Europe, a third of the total of Jews in the world. But in Europe, where the World War II was fought, it was two thirds. By comparison, the best estimates, and this comes actually from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, sir, and I am the chairman of the board of that, is that there were roughly 1.5 million Armenians living under the Ottoman Empire in 1915 at the time of the general. And that 
somewhere between 664,000 up to 1.2 million Christian Armenians were massacred, were died of starvation or forced detention. So we're talking about over 50% at a minimum and perhaps as much as three quarters. So on a percentage basis, it's really quite equivalent to the devastation of the Holocaust. And this is one of the reasons that I'm so interested in the topic that you do, because there are so many other comparisons that we can talk about during our conversations. And here is a very important connection. Uh, when the final solution was formally decided upon at the Bonsai House in 1942 in Germany, one of those who participated said uh, to Hitler, Fuhrer, if we do this to the Jews, it will be a black mark on German history for a thousand years. It was said, no, no one remains, remembers the Armenians. No one remembers the Armenians. So he took the fact that from 1915 1942, the world had forgotten about the Armenians. Therefore, he thought the same would be true here. So and that's why the two are so similar, the Holocaust and the genocide, in the sense that each involved mass killing of huge percentages of the people involved, two-thirds of your jury, uh, anywhere from more than 50 percent to perhaps three quarters. They're being Christian, but they came part and parcel with an effort by those who perpetrated the genocide to also engage in mass looting, in uprooting the culture of the communities they were seeking to kill. It was not sufficient to just kill, kill the people. The whole history, the whole religious culture, had to also be uprooted. And with the genocide. Came confiscation. That's the connection that's made in each instance. But all that comes back again to the fact that the first genocide of this century was the Armenian genocide. That's how we should be remembered. It's the first genocide of the century. It preceded the Holocaust. Hitler made it clear that he understood the connection and that because no one seemed to care about it, Genocide of the Armenians. Same would be true for the genocide of the President Biden made a historic book recently on April 24. This statement is a question that he's going to make. Can you speak on that? Yes, I think that what President Biden did on April 24, 2021 was truly historic and something no other president. You know, Turkey is a NATO ally. Uh, it's still a very sensitive issue. I want to come back to that kind of interest in Germany. Uh, so it was a very courageous decision. And it joins now 33 other countries for a total of 34 recognize the Armenian genocide. And that provides a legal framework to begin working on restitution of cultural property, uh, religious property artifacts that were part of the Armenian genocide. So it was a very important statement. But it's very important to ask the way in which the post-World War II German government dealt with the crimes during World War II, and the post-Ottoman Empire Turkish government dealt with the part of the Armenian situation in the following sense. Germany, through Chancellor Adenauer in 1951, made a personal statement as Chancellor that we, the German people, in whose name the genocide of Jews, Holocaust, was created and implemented, owe an obligation. We apologize for it, but we owe an obligation. 
obligation to the victims. Uh, Turkey, after the formation of the Turkish Republic, took exactly the opposite position. They not admitted to the Trump state. And uh, they denied that there was such a case. So we have a very different historical context after each chance. One of your important accomplishments was the convening of a conference in 1998 um, on the Washington principles of Nazi confiscated art. Uh, could you speak about that and how to investigate this? So I think that hope at your conference, your UCLA, can follow the same succession that ours did from the Bard Conference and then I can be in the London Conference, 1990, where I made an announcement that I was going to have an invitation to over 40 countries to come to Washington in 1997 for a conference focused on that sort of We had, at the tail end of the London Conference, I was able to shoot one in um, over the British objection. Hector Feliciano, some other professors speaking at the conference uh, to raise the elevated issue. But hopefully your conference will begin to elevate this issue. One can hope that your conference will be the beginning of it that we can have the application of the concept of these Washington which is museums and galleries should look at their collections and see if there are any that are potentially confiscated, in this case, uh, from the Armenian genocide, uh, do the provenance research, publish those audits, allow claims processes, right? and then here's the key phrase we used in the Washington Principles, to come to a fair and just solution. I think that we should see your conference as the beginning of the process, related though it is, as it was with the Bard Conference, then our conference in 1997 uh, in Washington, that led to the Washington Principles of Nazi art. That's still relevant today. You could hardly look up the art section of the New York Times in any given week without finding some reference to some piece of Nazi looted art that has been returned, restituted, or in attention. I hope that your conference will elevate that issue to the same degree. It did so much more than just an art. It actually began with the Swiss, as you mentioned, and Nazi gold, the Swiss banks, and the deposits. Then you began looking at Holocaust insurance, and then you focused with Germany and the companies that employ slave laborers. What lessons can we take away from what you did and the, the work that you did in putting together these monumental agreements? It seems I remember during the end of the Clinton administration, almost every week there was an announcement of another agreement that you had put together as a diplomat. For these countries to have some kind of a restitution process. The lesson that I draw from what we did is to have someone who cares enough, and I did, to drive the process, to have a president who cared enough to support everything I did, and he did. I mean, for example, the German slave labor cases, uh, he three times appealed to German Chancellor Schroeder to contribute additional funds to what the private sector did. And it's the first time in history that the private sector paid for harms that it caused during the war. Um, so having the support of the president and the whole White House today, I've seen the very National Security Council, was critically important. Uh, and then really tricking the conscience of the world so the basic fact that it is not proper, it's not acceptable for anyone to hold confiscated property 
this should be a basic rule. And that when you're holding confiscated funds, certainly that came out of uh, a warlike situation, massacres, genocidal situation with the Armenians uh, as a result of the Holocaust, that it is a stain on your reputation as a museum, as a gallery, as an individual holder, to have that kind of art. It's not acceptable. And in the 21st century, ways it should be found, even belatedly, to deal with that in a fair and just way. That to me is critical. So one of the things that's going to be the challenge, I think, in this Armenia situation is how do you elevate this issue? How do you prick the conscience of the world to something that happened even further back? So it doesn't have sort of public visibility, it doesn't have its own museum, uh, its own uh, testimony to the genocide. That will be the big challenge. But this conference, I think, is, is the way to start it. And again, the key to me is following it up with having provenance researchers elevate what museums, what institutions continue to hold Armenian artifacts, books, manuscripts, religious objects, uh, artworks, uh, as a result of the Armenian genocide. And then once that's done, I think more than half the battle is won because the publicity that then will come, reputational damage, holding on to that, or not at least coming to a fair and just solution, as the Getty Museum did. Uh, will be overwhelmed. Very little progress has been made on the Armenian side, and it's my hope and fervent hope that your UCLA Bayola conference will be the beginning of the kind of recognition that we were able to achieve for Holocaust justice, not again only in paying compensation to individuals, but in recovery. Uh, lost artifacts, lost art, lost religious objects, part and parcel of the genocide. Well, we had an interview you gave 20 years ago. We can now stop, uh, maybe. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you. This is his last statement. It's also important, but I was told that there will be another event, and uh, so I should stop shorter so that we have some time to discuss. Uh, the ramification of this kind of thing. Maybe you disagree with me, but it is for me a, it's a historic statement from a statesman. And it will, it should have some ramification. And I have uh, some uh, ideas I would like to pray in this talk. Originally, I also uh, planned to give an overview on the Armenian genocide recognition. So two concepts are important. One is Armenian genocide recognition movement, and the other, now that I'm talking, the reason that I want to show you this interview, it is the Armenian genocide restitution. This is the actually the core of my talk. And I skipped this history or historiography of Armenian genocide recognition movement then continue from today. So regarding where we currently stand with the Armenian genocide in the US, we can confidently state that the recognition has been given. Both houses, Congress and Senate and the uh, uh, representatives, and the president 2021, 2022, and definitely believe that he will repeat 2023, the recognition has been given. The question of justice, however, remains unaddressed. And what is necessary then to discuss the possibility is of an Armenian genocide reparation. To this end, I offer two observations, you all know that. Number one, in the United States, the politique of recognition have now largely run their course. So, 
the Armenian communities over the decades really worked very hard for the recognition. So now, number two, it is a wishful thinking to suppose that given the current state of international relations, the world's great powers will exercise pressure anyway, anyway, on Turkey to acknowledge the Armenian genocide. You might have heard the recent news, the F-16, uh, the warplanes and so on, the American government gave the green light to Turkey. And it's almost impossible. It is therefore time to hold a serious and prolonged discussion on what comes next. Well, this is my activist part now talking about it. It is obvious for the politics of recognition, it should be replaced with a politique of reparation or resolution. And one that can create a movement for the Armenian genocide. And this movement should consider itself as operating not within the framework of American foreign policy. This is my argument, but as part of American domestic policy. The Holocaust restitution movement offers us ample tools of the potential efficiency of such an act, as we listened to him. To better explain that point, what I mean, a little background information is in order. American recognition of the Armenian genocide does not resemble that of the countries whose recognition has largely had symbolic value. The official recognition by the United States technically does and can offer the possibility of attaining a certain level of justice in the way of reparation and recompense. American law allows its citizens to sue foreign countries, companies, and or institutions for damages and compensation. However, the United States has a law known as Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act of 1976, FSIA, which serves to prevent foreign countries or their affiliated institutions from being taken to the court and sued in the United States. Some exceptions do exist, however, and are of direct relevance to our topic. One of these exceptions related to the crime against humanity. Okay. International law is very important. Countries and their associated institutions that are seen to have been involved in crime against humanity, such as genocide, can be taken to trial in United States court. However, for this to occur, it is necessary for the federal government to first recognize that such a crime has been committed. Because this was not the case, more than 10 different court cases were dismissed in California by the California court saying that this is a federal government policy and federal government has no policy related to Armenian genocide, we are not going there. So they dismiss the case. Now, number one, as I said, the federal uh, government uh, must accept event as a crime, and but it also not sufficient ground to open a case. Two additional preconditions must be first met. First, we need to show that the target of the suit, be it a state or institution, was both involved in the perpetration of a crime. So the company that you are going to sue, you should also show that this company made profit from that crime. And the second important precondition is that this company has to trade relation with the United States. So it's very simple. I put it in a very simple way. I'm not a legal scholar, but uh, this is the overall picture. And if you fit these three conditions, then you can file a lawsuit here in the United States. But of course, it's not a one-way street. When I summarize this way, my legal scholar always smiles. It is 
more complicated, and there is a high probability that such cases will not be legally successful, especially after the Supreme Court judgment 2021. Supreme Court made a decision related to Germany saying that if a foreign country confiscated the properties of its own citizen, it is not a violation of international law. So nobody can bring the case related to confiscation into a United States court. But the court in this decision of the Supreme Court, in this case in hand, said. So you can argue that case that we have in our hand is different, or you can argue in a different way. But in any event, it is very clear that the United States Supreme Court made a political decision. And it is really an important legal problem how to interpret these decisions and how we should interpret these exceptions. But at least overall, we should see and acknowledge that there is a path here to follow. So I'm not a legal scholar, and I cannot discuss the legal ramification of the Supreme Court's decision and other uh, 1976 uh, laws and the exceptions and so on. Legal scholar arguing back and forth on that part. But it is important for us to see that there is a new venue. And here is, as usual in all other cases, politique is the important. It is a, not the only legal issue, it is a political problem also. And this is one of the important tasks of Armenian communities to consider this as a political problem. And in that sense, Biden said is very important when he says President Biden's Acknowledgement of Armenian genocide provides the legal frame for Armenian reparation movement here in the United States. It's a strong political statement. So this is this should be taken seriously because this is from a person who was in charge of Holocaust-related restitution problem, and he was the person who really made pay the way for all these reparation and restitution. So the Holocaust restitution movement can provide an example. This is my argument. And here is some basic information on Holocaust restitution movement. It has mainly three major stages. The first stage is just after the first and second world war. The Allied power established a trial committee the, uh, France, Great Britain, and the United States, and they took the confiscated German properties, Nazis, pro Nazi properties, and tried to distribute to its original owners. It was not a very successful process, but at least there was an attempt in the first stage of the Holocaust restitution movement to give the properties back to Jews and non-Jews And you may not know, this is my addition now to that, it was exactly the same after 19. When the First World War was ended, ended, Ottoman government, because of several other considerations, along with Germany and along with Germany, I'm sorry, along with Great Britain and France, started a process of giving back the confiscated properties of Christian population. And this initiative of Great Britain, France, and the Ottoman government, all together, because we had a government which were against the uh, Union and Progress Party who organized the uh, genocide, and several a article Sever Agreement 1920, Article 144, that exactly with the question of reparation and restitution. Other paragraphs also, I didn't put them. This is the, uh, ex uh, the important one. The paragraph from 141 to 158, different articles 
that directly with the reparation and restitution. Even Armenians, or even those scholars who deal with the several rose on, they never look into, into that part of the story because we mostly discuss the several rose on agreements as a territorial dispute. But it was something else also. So that there are similarities between Holocaust restitution, early restitution, and the Armenian genocide restitution. And the second stage is the, you may all know about it, 1952 Luxembourg Agreement. Uh, Germany agreed uh, to compensate the Jewish losses. And in, uh, there was a huge opposition in Israel against it. This is a topic for itself, but at the end, in 1952, Germany and Israel made an agreement. This is called Luxembourg Agreement. And there was a second part of this agreement. It is the agreement between German government and the Claim Commission. What is Claim Commission? Claim Commission was a Jewish organization established among around 28 different Jewish institutions and organizations. They came together, they organized themselves, and it's called Clay Commission. And Clay Commission made a special agreement with Germany also. So today, we don't have Armenian Clay Commission. Armenians never put this topic on their agenda. This is, I mean, this is where scholarship comes. We push them, they, they, they should really start to think about. It's not, it's enough to say that, oh, we were killed, we were, uh, we, the terms are so bad, and to, to cry and memorize, and uh, these are good, we have to do all this, but at the same time, we should not be, of course, reparation and restitution can never bring back what is caused, but it is, it has also a symbolic nature at the end, but it is important, it is part of that. So the Armenian communities faced with the problem, this is my argument, to establish their claim commissions. Without establishing a claim commission and talking with American government in name of this claim commission, they might not go much forward. I think. So this is the uh, one important issue. Uh, compared to Holocaust and uh, Holocaust restitution movement and Armenian genocide. Uh, but there are certain differences between Holocaust and Armenian genocide also, despite what I understand told us. One is, as I repeated several times, the attitude of Turkish government, it will continue. In Holocaust case, the Jews, they always found that alternative. Germany always listened to that. Not only Germany, Switzerland, France, because they thought it's not good for their democratic reputation. They have to do something. So in Holocaust restitution movement, you have the partners who are ready to listen to you, and they didn't want to give it in Swiss case, for example, it is really very important to know the details. Swiss government denied from the beginning any goal or any reparation to Jewish survivors, but at the end, because of this reputation issue, but also because of the court cases. Court cases made really Swiss government scared of the development. So they had to make the negotiations. And another important difference between Holocaust and Armenian genocide and restitution, the amount of political support that each movement has either obtained thus far or has the potential of obtaining, especially within the United States. Support of the Armenian initiatives has yet to reach a satisfactory level. The Armenian American government with this last decision yesterday, I mean, American government may continue to voice the arguments it repeatedly used to avoid recognition. They used two classical arguments for their denial of recognition of Armenian genocide. Number one, the importance of US-Turkish relations 
and United States national interest in the Middle East. These are still valid arguments. They are a political argument, and the United States government can easily continue to use this argument. But on the other hand, the likelihood of eventually obtaining sufficient political support for the Armenian restitution movement, or Armenian case, is greater than we think. At the very least, it is legitimate now to expect that the United States government, having recognized the Armenian genocide, would adopt a stance like that taken regarding the Holocaust. The political support of the executive branch are inevitable. Then we may ask, why shouldn't the American government, as it did in the case of Holocaust, open an office of special envoy for the Armenian genocide issue within the State Department? There is already such an institution exists for the Holocaust. So it's easy for Armenians to make the same demand. And as you may know, the Office of Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues develops and implements U.S. policy to return Holocaust-era assets to their rightful owners, secure compensation for Nazi-era wrongs, and ensure that the Holocaust is remembered and commemorated appropriately. So you can very easily argue it would be a very unfortunate argument to assert that what was right for the Holocaust would not be right for the Armenian genocide. I believe Armenian communities, especially this is that I said, it's a domestic policy issue. In California, Armenians have enough leverage in their hands to make this happen if they establish their own lady commission and ask their representative as one of these. Uh, their demands. There are some other legal ways also. Armenian genocide recognition by house is a symbolic actually. It is not legally binding. The other very interesting question, why Armenian communities, which can, they can do that without much difficulty as part of domestic policy, my argument, to push Congress after recognition of Armenian genocide, because they already did, pass a similar law like Holocaust cases 2009 and 2006. There were laws on bill accepted by Congress on the Holocaust rooted act. And it is a bill, binding bill, and it can um, easily be done for also United, uh, for Armenian states. So, of course, the, uh, my argument is California, the Armenian community in California can do that easily as if they can come together and develop this as one of the important demand of their claim. This is the new debate that I want to introduce that to the Armenian community. Of course, the process of attaining justice and reparation will take many paths and should not be limited to that litigation, nor there is a guarantee for that success. Reparation movement took 70, 80 years. Who knows, maybe this reparation movement will take another 70 or 80 years. The Armenian genocide restitution movement will be long and strong with a great many legal and political hurdles, just as we have in case of genocide recognition. Let us not forget that the campaign for recognition continued for decades before finally achieving success. And we should, must therefore be prepared for a struggle no less long and no less arduous. So, this is my new human rights activist perspective after the recognition of our genocide. Thank you very much for that. A few questions. Thank you, Dr. Akjam. So we're going to um, take a couple questions, both 
online and um, in the room. Um, just wanted to let you know, by the way, we will stop at 425. Um, I'm going to put a hard stop just because um, you can stay behind, of course, but there's an event at 430 that we'd like to walk over. If those of you, sorry, the scheduling on the program is just, that starts at 430 for those of you that would like to go. Um, it is a musical performance at the Mirabella, um, Mirabella uh, Auditorium. It's, and I, I can show you that afterwards. Okay, without further ado, um, there might be a couple of questions online or in the yeah. room. So um, not yet online, but um, and please, if you can also introduce yourself, it would be great. Please go ahead. Um, hello, my name is Indio Oranli. Uh, I work here at ASU. Uh, I talk about uh, the denial of the Armenian genocide from a political perspective, and I'm from Turkey. So um, my question is regarding the upcoming elections in Turkey in May, if the opposition party wins, I feel like there might be an opening for Armenian genocide recognition if, you know, Kılıç Tarolo becomes the president and the, there's a new democratization movement that, you know, may happen. So do you have any thoughts about that? Like, I know you, your talk focused on uh, reparation processes in the United States, in California, but I think, you know, as a Turkish person myself, I think, you know, the, the, the Turkish population needs to know that uh, this happened. Uh, I only learned about the Armenian genocide when I was 24 years old. I had an Armenian friend at Boazici University. And then a couple of years later, Grant Think, Armenian journalist Grant Think was assassinated. Then I started reading about Ottoman history and Armenian relations. So my question is, and I know you've like been working on this for decades now. Like, what are some uh, possible uh, policies or possible um, uh, activists? I don't know. Um, emerging activist possibilities that you can envision to you know grow this recognition in Turkey, like? Uh, Thank you so much, great question. And I have a very pessimist answer. <laughs> I don't believe that there's going to be any change in Turkish government's policy regarding uh, genocide, regarding recognition. One of the major partners of the opposition is an extreme nationalist party. And to surprise to all of you, actually, AKP government at the outset of their governing period, they were more open to Armenian genocide related issues than today's Because of their Islamic character, it was easy for them, not easy, but it made them possible the distance between themselves and a secular union and progress nation of Islam. But then over a decade, they changed their policy and they took over traditional Turkish state policy. I personally don't expect any change related to Turkey's policy towards genocide, the government policy, and not toward Azerbaijan. So the regional policies want to change. This is, I might be, let's hope that I will be wrong. Uh, but there is a positive side if opposition wins. It will bring more democracy. Democratic right, freedom of speech. Here my radical argument. Actually, you will surprise to hear from me. Actually, we, those critical scholar and individual like Grant King, or those who are in favor of opening society towards us. We want the psychological war. We are the winner. If you listen to any or any governing or government regarding April 24, they are intense. We were not targeted of hate campaigns and we were not dragged from court to court to. Psychologically, 
we want the world. This is how I think. This is my personal interpretation. And with the opening of the public space, with more democracy, with more freedom of speech, and so on, it will be easy to create another recognition movement a la Turkish form. As you may know, before AKP became more dictatorial, there were Armenian genocide commemorations in more than 20 cities, especially in Kurdish provinces. The Kurdish mayors, they even erected the monuments for Armenian genocide. So my hope that the opening will help to discuss the issue. This is like an entrance ticket to a game. At least then we will be able to argue and to make our case. This is the positive side, but I don't think that there will be any change regarding government policies. Thank you, Dr. Rana. Um, please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. This is Dara. I'm from Afghanistan. You know that the, the genocide uh, against uh, uh, the genocide that happened in Turkish, and it was like a, a large section of uh, Armenian country, but killed uh, almost about one and a half million people were killed. But uh, uh, in fact, I don't uh, have enough information about that. But while I was uh, listening to one of Elif Shafak's speech, and she was saying that when I mentioned in my book about the Armenian genocide, my life was in danger. And uh, I was not able to go walk inside the Istanbul city. I was uh, I was uh, sent in, inside the Turkish. So uh, she was like uh, helping. Uh, she was walking inside the city by helping some girls, having some bodyguards. So uh, I'm just uh, my question is here that why uh, still in Istanbul people cannot uh, raise their voice when they, they they want to talk about the Armenian genocide. The government uh, try to shut their voice, and they, they don't want to speak about that. Because uh, I'm from Afghanistan, and uh, the same thing happened uh, with us. Like I'm a Afghan, and tickets ago, like hundred years ago, like our uh, almost like uh, sixty-two percent of our people were killed because of uh, some of the religious issues. They were not accepting that the government. So I say we are not able to talk about that when we are talking. The government. Uh, the world, they are not uh, listening to us, and the government, they, they, of course, they are not supporting us. And I, I think that we have the same issue in Turkey, and instead we cannot talk about that. Why? And how can we talk about that? Because we have the same issue in Turkish, like Hazara people in uh, Afghanistan, like Armenian people in Turkish. Yeah. That's it. Thank you very much. I mean, it's a one million dollar question, <laughs> <laughs> and there was no short answer. And I'm Turkish, and uh, I have been working on Armenian genocide since 1991. And at every event since 1991, I face this question why Turks do not Armenian genocide? So uh, it's a long topic for itself. Uh, originally, I thought uh, there is a psychological defense mechanism, namely, you can hardly call your founding fathers as thieves and murderers. If you openly talk on Armenian genocide, every nation has the heroes. American has their heroes. You wrote enough about the Native Americans here, Alex, and every nation really lionized their, lionized their founding fathers. And if you open up the history, then these founding fathers emerge as thieves or murderers. A society can deal with this only if they put enough distance between themselves and their founders. In America, you can do that. You can talk about your founders. You can call them, yeah, they are they were the slave owners, because the democratic structure of society allowed. But if you identify yourself so strongly with your founding, you think 
go to any distance between yourself and them, then any critique of them comes as if they criticize the attack you, saying to defense yourself. No, nobody can call me murder. I never touch an Armenian. So self defense, psychological self defense mechanism. This is the reason the democracy is very important. Because it will even deter the possibility, you know, these are their your founders, they might have done some good things also, like the American 1776, the Declaration of Freedom, and so on and so forth. But you know, this is the other part, and this system help you to navigate so many difficult questions. In Turkey, we don't have this navigation. I thought this as I thought. And I worked a lot afterward on the money aspect, the properties. Now I'm more convinced than before that actually it is the material aspect of the issue. Turkey today sits on the belt of Christianity. Entire society based on the balance. You don't call it genocide. You call that we send our meetings to Florida. Or to Arizona, it's better place instead of mountains, uh, snowy areas, cold. And it doesn't make any difference. You sit on the belt of its people. If you slightly acknowledge that there is something wrong there, then the other would ask, okay, let's talk about it. restitution and revolution. I think this is. One of the major fear of the British government, the reparation cost. This is the other I see two more hands. I'll start from here and then come back to the back. And please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, um, my name is Rishabh. I'm a student at ASU and also assistant director of the Korean Center for Mass Atrocity Prevention and Internet Freedom House. So we recently uh, issued a report with Freedom House on transnational repression which uh, it, uh, my question actually relates to what you were saying for. Um, Turkey is one of the most notorious uh, Asians of that transnational repression. And um, it to, to, to directs people who speak out about the Armenian genocide in the US and Iran in Europe, uh, even in South Asia. So I was kind of curious, first of all, have you been a target of repression yourself? And second, um, how do we encourage people to speak out despite the fear of being targeted by governments uh, like Turkey, China, or Iran? Well, I cannot talk about other countries. Uh, I, yeah, for my own uh, history, just go to Wikipedia. <laughs> I'm a rebel. I started when I was very young. Uh, I don't know whether, uh, you know, 68 movement. It was a huge movement. I was one of those boys went in the streets when I was 15 or 16 against the Vietnam last so long time. All my my family and myself interest. So I have a long history. Uh, regarding Armenian genocide, I was started. I was put on a death list. I received a lot of death threats. Uh, when police launched an investigation in 2009, they discovered in one of the police officers' house a document and name of three individuals who should be assassinated. Branding, Orhan Pamuk, Tanara Kicham. Branding, assassinated, and Orhan Pamuk escaped, like Elif Shabak, another Nobel Prize winner. And my name was also on that list. There were several court cases against me, but uh, after a period of time, uh, Turkish government respected me as a serious scholar. So today there is no criminal investigation against me, and I'm not tired of any persecution. But if I were in Turkey, they would have been in prison like Osman Kavala, one of my best friends who is a civil rights activist and is in prison now. So there is potential danger there. Well, I don't have any formula what should we say. Uh, my 
standard answer is there is a monument in Washington that says freedom is not free. So if you want to freedom, you have to fight for it. And but you need, of course, at least democratic structures. But this is the one of the major issues. Thank you. Hello. Uh, we, we knew, um, um, I'm from Burma, Myanmar. Um, I have uh, two questions. One, what does the U.S. did after the recognition? What are the steps they have taken, the U.S. government? And two, when you talk about restitution, you are talking about um, re restitutions of their properties. What does it mean? Is it like land itself or uh, houses or businesses? If it is land, what do you mean by that land? Are you talking about the entirety of the Armenian nation land as a as a, some sort of territory? Or what kind of restitutions or uh, it, it's not about land? And um, and what is feasible and what in ideal situation, what what do you think is realistic? restitutions. Um, I understand that there is not even a recognition. Uh, there is at least a massive country, country-wide denialism about the uh, Armenian genocide. Um, but in ideal world, if it is something uh, going to happen, what is the extent of restitutions do you want? And uh, yeah, I guess. Thank you so much for your first question. I mean, both are great. And I think I haven't done anything yet, and I'm very suspicious of the future, unless Armenian claim commission starts making this as an important political thing. I'm not sure. I mean, in California, without Armenian vote, we cannot go to San There is not much stronger leverage than this. So this is only a domestic movement in the United States can change American government. This is my first uh, answer to the question. The second one, what is reparation? What is to expect? Let me take my scholarly hat back again. It's better and easier for us. I will have the conversation. Okay, we will provide the ground to start a conversation. A restitution or reparation, regardless the amount of money or land. Number one, it is a moral issue. And the moral issue can only function if both sides says. Okay, I agree with it. So it is not enough to think that Armenians want historic Armenia, today's eastern part of Turkey, give us all that the problem So then you have to take this stuff from the people who are living around 25, 30 million. So you have to find a way that Armenians say generally, you cannot satisfy each and every individual. Are, and they are representative, of course, the Armenian government and the claim commission of Armenians, the diaspora, would say, yes, we are satisfied. And the Turkish parliament on the other side, we did what we had to do. We really at least rectified some of the wrong things. So the scholar can help to that process. And I think this question will be the question of the next 100 years. It's like the Native American case. You will never find a proper answer and proper solution. But my answer is a conversation on that topic is a very healthy and democratic. And it is better than what result you see. The conversation on it is more important than the result that you achieve because it helps democratization. 
and you will hear from Armenian different groups and organizations so many different proposals regarding revolution and constitution. There are some out there and they are talking, discussing, and so on, etc. And as scholar, we should provide the platform for this because the discussion is healthier than the results. So I Dr. Akshan, I'm going to invite you for your um, closing remark so that we can wrap up and um, invite our guests also both to attend the next um, event if you wish. So please, dear. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>